Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. Would you all stand with me if you are um, willing and able? And I will start us off with prayer this morning or this evening. What time is it? 631. Okay, evening. Would you uh, bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together. Lord, tonight I just pray that as we are here together in this building, that we would be able to worship you together in unison. Lord, uh, we just come before you and we lift you up in praise. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help our hearts and our minds to be solely focused on you with no distractions. We just love you so much, Father, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus is calling. Church, this song is not just for people who are coming to the Lord for the first time coming to the altar. It's a daily thing I feel that we have to do. 
to give our burdens and our, our things that we're going through to the Lord. So let's sing this bridge again, and I want us to just praise him and give it all to him, everything that you're going through. So let's sing this again. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before. got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do every song of Raise your hands with me. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king. Set for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you, so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, but I've nothing for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So 
I'm on my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I sing this bridge one more time. Wait, hold on. We're not done yet. Sorry, Kevin. I got you excited, right? <laughs> um, but these words in the bridge, come on my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on, on me. Lift up your song because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. When you think of a lion, what does that make you think of? You want to like, get up and growl. So as we sing this song, uh, would you if you're able, will you stand with us as we sing this song? Because I want, as we sing this, I want us to s roar it like a lion. Like we're praising the Lord. We're praising the Lord. So I want to sing this song and I just, I want, like, throw up your hands, give him what you have, and let's just praise him together. Just don't be shy about it. Like it says in the song, don't you get shy on me. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. So I'm telling you guys, don't you guys get shy on me. Let's, uh, let's sing this again. So come on my soul, oh don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. So come on my soul, oh don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those and praise the Lord one more time so come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you got a line inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord come on my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. Hallelujah, 
And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the ability to praise you, Lord, to lift up our hands, God, to just sing your praises at the top of our lungs. I just pray for boldness for our church, Lord, everyone in this building, that as we worship every Sunday and Wednesday, and as we're going to the grocery store, going to work, going to school, whatever we're doing, that you would give us boldness to just sing to you all the time, God, dance for you all the time, even when we're in the grocery store, so that we would have the boldness to sing and dance for you, Lord. We want to have that joy to be able to do that without shame. God, we just love you, and I just pray that tonight as we are digging into your word that we would be searching for you endlessly, Lord, that we would be longing to know more about you, to get closer to you. God, we just love you. We just thank you again for our congregation, for all of our church family, for our pastors that teach to us. Lord, I, I pray that you would speak through Pastor Kevin tonight. Lord, we just love you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Reese, my turn. You're not done yet. Have you got a birthday song in there? Have you got a birthday song in there? Are you able to? Can you can you do can you do happy birthday on your guitar? All right. So does anybody have a birthday here tonight? Ah, uh, yeah. Shyly she puts her hand up. So stand up, Thelma. Thelma is. I I learned a long time ago that I don't say the the age of of women. So do you, if you don't want anybody to know, I won't say. I can say it? I knew you probably didn't have a problem with that. Okay, so she is um, 61 years old today. Liar. Yeah, I'm a liar. 61. Yeah, you don't look a day over 62, true. No, nope, Thelma is 81 years old today. And so this is her. This is her birthday. Last year, we had a wonderful celebration for her for her 80th birthday, her family and friends in Exeter. And I was reminded today, and you can probably think of who reminded me, that today is your birthday, and we love you very much, Thelma, and it's, I always look for you in the front row, you and Elva and Susan and, and uh, the gang here in that front row. So happy birthday. So would you lead us in a round of happy birthday? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the chorus, so we're just going to sing it. Yeah, that's fine. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Thelma. Happy birthday to you. And many, many more. All right, thanks for being a good sport. So, um, also, we are missing somebody in the front row here as well, and that's Elva. I heard. So, Elva, you know, many of you know Elva here. Um, Elva had a little slip and fall this morning, apparently, and she has cracked her wrist and has hurt her knee and has maybe got a chip out of a bone chip, maybe is out of, so I mean, she's got uh, a little bit of trouble. Let's just say she's got a little trouble, so not walking too well. So I want to just say a quick prayer for Elva as well because that, you know, she already struggles with her disability from from a previous issue and, and with her leg, and so this is just going to make it so much more, even more complicated for us. So if you just join me for a quick word of prayer for our friend Elva. Dear Heavenly Father, we do pray, Father, for Elva. Father, this um, happened just this morning, and she is home tonight, and I just pray, Lord, one, that she'll be able to function at home, that she's not going to need additional help, or she's not going to have to seek further services as she, you know, begins this process of healing. We just pray your hand upon her. Father, give her comfort, help her to have peace with this. We pray for healing. We pray for discernment for the doctors. We just pray your hand upon her, please. Father, thank you, Lord. Just be with her tonight and going forward and help us as a church as always to know what is the right thing to say and to do to help. So, Father, we thank you. We love you, and we just offer her into your hands. We pray this in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so if you know Alva, please send her 
please send her your, your wishes, please. All right, well, welcome to our Wednesday night. Uh, you know, back we survived the youth beach camp, which was a wonderful experience. Joe may have mentioned a little bit on Sunday morning or may have had a little information, but we had 18 kids. We had nine girls, nine boys. We had about seven leaders and split up between two houses, and we just had a fabulous time. Morro Bay Police Department was not called once, which is always a positive sign. Morro Bay Fire Department was not called once, so that's even a, you know, even a better sign. Um, you know, minor sunburns as usual, minor sand burns as usual. You know, I think I got a little owie when I was cooking the tri-tip, you know, so was that was probably the worst of it. Poor boy, you know, I, I hurt my little finger cooking tri-tip or something. But it was a great great weekend and I mean just powerful pastor Eric you know um, you know as our youth leader did a you know wonderful job leading the teaching um, we had a great testimony by by you know Sandra offered a wonderful testimony to the kids um, we had uh, the worship was just so powerful I mean what what we see with Reese here on Sunday and Wednesday he just had those kids in the palm of his hand over the course of that of that three days, and it was just powerful to see, you know, those youth who are, who are in a very difficult world that they're just they're raising their hands and they're holding their hands out and they're praying and they're they're excited about the music. I mean, it looked like a little rave that was going on there for a bit. You know, they're they're jumping up and down. You know, and I mean, it's shaking the house as they are jumping up and down as the as the song is playing. And and then you know, so I tried to participate. You know, but I do the little you know kind of up and down on the toes. I don't you know necessarily clear the ground. And I got called out on that a little bit by by doing that. But it was just a great great weekend. So. Thanks to all who support our youth program and work in the youth program, and it was a blessing, truly a blessing over the weekend. A uh, couple of announcements, just want to make sure people are aware. Sunday morning as we start the new month, um, I believe Judy and Kathy Gray will be here at 9.15 Sunday morning before morning service uh, where um, they will have their women's time of prayer a small prayer group. They invite any of the women of our church who want to come in a little bit before service. Service starts at 10. They come in at 9.15. And she and Kathy sit over in what we call the groom's room and, and just come in and pray for whatever it is that they can pray with you and for you and be praying for you going forward. So please join that. We have our regular service at 10 o'clock. Pastor Joe, you finished up Number, you finished up 10, you'll be starting chapter 11 um, on Sunday morning. And then, of course, Monday is the 4th of July. Hopefully you have a little, you know, something planned for that just in celebration, whatever it may be. Um, you know, but our Most Excellent Way group will be meeting on that evening. So 7 o'clock on Monday evening, we traditionally meet regardless of the holidays. I think it, we were truly tested when Christmas Day was was that day, and we actually took that night off. But traditionally programs, um, faith-based recovery programs and such typically meet on the holidays because that's when people quite often are in need of, of friendship and support. So we will be here Monday night at 7 o'clock for anyone who, who may need to, who would like to attend or if you're a regular attender. Uh, men's ministry would normally meet this next Monday night as well, but because of the holiday, they're postponed to Monday, July 11th. So the following Monday, they will be meeting for their light meal and continuing in their study in Ephesians. And then summer Bible camp is right around the corner. So July 17th, 18th, and 19th, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday here. Um, working, you know, have been working on getting our sets ready for the opening and the skits and getting our volunteers lined up and getting the different activities and everything in place for that. And we're going to have everything ready to go and all we need are the kids. Now last year I think we had about a dozen. I think we had about 12 kids, and my prayer is not that I'm putting a limit on God, not that I'm saying, God, you know, I, I only want this many, but I, I'm praying for 25. I'm praying that we double that number this year, that we have 25 kids who come to our, our three-night um, SBC summer Bible camp, uh, and in order to help for that, on the back table, we have printed up some invitation cards, so I don't want you to take 50 of them and go because, you know, we only have 100, so, you know, but I would like you to take two or three. If you think of two or three families in the neighborhood that you might, you know, want to go over and drop a card off to them and invite them to our three-night um, 
um, VBS style, what we call summer Bible camp. Um, you may have family members who have, you may have nieces or nephews or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or whatever it is. Please take a couple of the cards and see if, you know, you can get, you know, someone who might be interested. Very easy to sign up on our website. Uh, for those that know how to use the QR code, you use the QR code to go right to the registration page or you go on to our website and it just pops up onto the web page when you first open it and there's the this registration very simple registration the the name and information and so forth the grade of the child this is k through six so pretty much any elementary age student is welcome to come and um, we're hoping that we get a you know get our number increased a little bit this year and you know pray that that may translate to a new family in our church so that's a, you know a wonderful opportunity for that as well so these are on the back table all right so last week we began our study in the book of Deuteronomy and as I'd mentioned many people kind of write Deuteronomy off as a repeat of the previous books especially Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers because it is a lot of repeat and a lot of repetition uh, but I really support the viewpoint that it is a book that offers a lot of additional insight to who God is and the desired relationship that he has for each of us, for, our, for his people. Um, and it translates not only to the people of Israel, but to us today. Because I'm a firm believer in my study of the Old Testament and the New Testament that God does not change. That God is the same God of the Old Testament that he is in the New and the things that he said in the Old Testament, I believe, are still as relevant today as they were at that time. God's opinions of things don't change. His character doesn't change. So there's so much value. And the nice thing about Deuteronomy is that, that it digs in a little bit deeper. And it expands the study that we've had in previous books. So it is well worth as we talked about last week, it uh, can be looked at in different ways, but I'm approaching it as the three speeches made by Moses. They're actually broken into three actual speeches or what are called discourses made by Moses to the people, resulting in this renewed covenant. You know, he had a covenant with the people at Mount Sinai, with the, with the grandparents and the parents that were at Mount Sinai, and they had that covenant, and that covenant was broken. And now this new generation is now preparing to go into the promised land. And Moses, through God, through Moses, is preparing to renew this covenant. Not create a new covenant, but renew that covenant that is based on mainly the laws and people's obedience to the law and his provision for them. So not much has changed there, but this new generation is going to have the opportunity to you know, come into agreement with God once again. And of course, all of this is to fulfill the promise made by God to Abraham many um, centuries before that began this process of redemption for the people of Israel, um, from their rescue from slavery in Egypt all the way now to being at the promised land. Last week, we ended the night reading verbatim most of chapter 4, what was described as, as one of the great sermons of the Bible. And I, and I challenged you, as Moses did, to think about those key words that Moses was telling to the people of Israel. He told them to look. In other words, to study, to pay attention, to, to be aware. He told them to watch out of the things that were happening around them. And then he, he told them to be careful, to be very careful as they move into this world, not to be influenced by those other nations around them and to remember, to remember what God had done for them, what they had witnessed and what, their, what their, um, their ancestors had witnessed as to the power of God and how that was still strong advice to us today. As we face many of the same physical and spiritual challenges today as Christians that Israel would face as they go into the promised land. Really no difference in our modern world. Now tonight we'll finish the final verses in chapter 4. And then we're going to cover chapter 5, where we're going to see Moses presenting the Ten Commandments. The core of the law given at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And we'll have a better understanding of how those commandments continue to impact us. And in fact, Deuteronomy can also be approached as a decalogue or of a study of the Ten Laws. So as we move forward through the chapters, all the way through to, I believe, almost chapter 28, we're going to have even more in-depth study of the law 
that tie almost directly in order to the Ten Commandments. But tonight, we're going to look at them specifically and somewhat superficially, but we'll get more material as we move through the weeks. As we move through the material tonight, I would like you to keep one thought in mind. And that is that God was dealing with the fact that there is only one God that Israel was to pay attention to. There is only one God, not many gods, that they were to follow as other nations believed. See, the land that they came from, Egypt, had hundreds of gods, maybe even a thousand gods. They had a god for every purpose, every insect, every, every creature, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything associated itself in some way or another with the god. Israel or Egypt and all of the pagan nations surrounding them were all what were called polytheistic nations. They all believed in multiple gods, depending on what the purpose of the god was. But Israel was only to recognize one god, Yahweh, Yahweh, Jehovah. And the primary issue that Israel faced was the impact of those polytheistic cultures that they would encounter. So in other words, while there will be physical battles, the biggest battles will be the spiritual battles. And this is what God and Moses is attempting to prepare them for. So let's begin our reading from Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. We'll just read this first paragraph or so. Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. So Moses called all the people of Israel together and said, Listen carefully, Israel. Hear the decrees and regulations I am giving you today so that you may learn them and obey them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Mount Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant with our ancestors, but with all of us who are alive today. At the mountain, the Lord spoke to you face to face from the heart of fire. I stood as an intermediary between you and the Lord, for you were afraid of the fire and did not want to approach the mountain. He spoke to me, and I passed his words on to you. Let's take a moment for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to teach this message. And I do pray, Father, that you will help me as I have a number of points here that I'm hoping to make, and I just pray, Father, that it will be your message, your words, your direction that will be given tonight. I just pray your hand upon me during this time. We thank you, Father, and we pray this in the wonderful name of your Son. Amen. All right, the second speech of Moses actually begins a few verses before. So I'm going to ask you to turn back to chapter 4, back to verse 44, and we're going to look at that very briefly where it tells us, verse 44 of chapter 4, where he states, Moses, this is the body of instruction that Moses presented to the Israelites. These are the laws, decrees, and regulations that Moses gave to the people of Israel when they left Egypt and as they camped in the valley near Beth Peor, east of the Jordan River. So we're told here that the focus of this next speech will be the laws given to Moses by God beginning with the Ten Commandments, the foundation of the law. The rest of the verses, those last verses in chapter 4, are really pointing to how they came to be in the land that they were at, how they were camped on this particular land, reminding them that they had just defeated two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og, in battle, and that they had completely destroyed them and had taken their cities um, as their own. That is where they are at this point. So now jumping to chapter 5. Moses tells the people, first of all, to listen carefully, from which they will, one, hear the decrees and regulations. So they are to listen carefully, to hear. And from that, they will learn them, and then they will obey them. So they are to listen, to learn, and to obey. How often in our own lives have we failed to listen carefully to something that we're being told? I could spend the next hour just telling you of the countless examples of times that somebody has told me something and it probably went in one ear and out the other, and then a short time later I'm brought to task or I need to remember what that was, and I I couldn't remember it, and I didn't recall, and I didn't pay attention and whatever it may be. 
One significant example in my life is the lesson that my father tried to teach me way back when I was a young, young man, 18 years old, most likely, and as I went into my early 20s, God, or Dad tried to teach me about the dangers of credit and reckless borrowing. See, my dad was a man who had been born in the time of the Depression. He was born in 1910. He lived through the Depression in through the 20s and the 30s. Dad bought one car on credit. I think it was a Model T Ford that he bought on credit and swore that he would never pay another dime of interest for a car for the rest of his life, and he never did. Dad purchased some property for the first time in his life, a farm. It was the only thing that he ever made payments on. Anything else, if he didn't have the cash, it wasn't going to happen. That was the mentality that my father had. And, but, you know, so Dad's trying to teach me as I'm beginning to live my life, and really, you could have anything you wanted with a, with a pen and a contract. I mean, my first car was bought on payments. My first, uh, well, my first nice car was bought on payments. Um, you know, figure it out pretty quickly how easy it was to get credit cards and be able to buy things and get things now and use credit cards and just make payments on it. Mortgages, second mortgages. Anybody here ever do the 125% mortgage where they were willing to give you 125% of the value of your home? Now, what kind of a deal is that? I mean, where do I sign to get that, to get, an, to get more money than my home is even worth? Boats, vacations. You know, that first years of my young life, I mean, I worked hard, I made good money, I, I was able to pay my bills, but I quickly started to figure out that my dad was probably right about some of this, that I was quickly, you know, getting into a place where I was just making others. He would say, I'm just making other people rich with the interest that I was paying instead of figuring out how to just be patient and wait and save and maybe not get something quite as nice, but it'll, it'll be something that's paid for. And I mean, so much wisdom that he offered during that. And yet I didn't listen. And during those years, I lived my life larger than my paycheck. And I pretty soon began to realize that I'm never going to probably get out of this debt, this hole that I've dug for myself. But you know, and I began to realize that those words of my father's, had I listened to him, would have made such a difference. It would have saved so much money, so much stress in my life if I'd have only heard him and listened to him and followed his advice. Fortunately, I did ultimately get things under control. It was a hard lesson, but, you know, fortunately there was no, you know, I can honestly say no bankruptcies or anything like that, but it sure makes life a whole lot different when you're able to, to, to get things into a different perspective. But it was a hard lesson for me. No different for us as Christians, because we still, even sitting here tonight, we have to open our ears and our minds to what God is telling us. And to take that teaching in and to allow it to fill us with the knowledge of God and his redemptive work, leading us then to desire and to truly want to obey him. So what Moses told them at the beginning of this second speech was just really very simple but very profound. Listen to me. Open your ears. Hear what God is saying. And then take it and use it. Learn from it and use it. So, so much that can be there. So in verse 2, Moses spoke of the covenant made with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. A covenant that was not made with their ancestors, as we're told, which is referring to the patriarchs of, of old, Abraham and such, but with the people of Israel. God spoke to the people face to face from the heart of fire. Turn with me, please, to Exodus 19. We're going to go back and take a quick look at when God first brought the, first, the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. So we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. Exodus 19, verse 16, where we read, On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain there was a long loud blast from a ram's horn and all the people trembled 
Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. Then shifting to chapter 20, God spoke to the people, giving them the Ten Commandments. God himself spoke to the people and gave them the Ten Commandments. And then after giving them those commandments, we read in verse 18 of chapter 20, verse 18, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling in fear. So this was an amazing and a frightening experience for the people who were at Mount Sinai some almost 40 years before. Some, we must remember, were still alive today because they were under the age of 20 when they refused to go into the Promised Land. So if if anybody was 18 years old at that time, then they were likely still alive and could remember that moment as they stood in this crowd listening to Moses today. There's very little difference between how God offered the commandments in Exodus 20 to what we'll be reading tonight, but those small changes I will try to point out to those just in order to understand the difference, but nothing significant. So we're going to spend some time tonight digging into these first commandments and then finishing out chapter 5. So verse 6, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt. We're back in... Um, the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 5, verse 6. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. These words were exactly the words used by God when he spoke to the people from the top of Mount Sinai. He's making it clear that I am the God who's placing this upon you. I am the God who is making this agreement with you. I am the God who redeemed you from your slavery, who took you out of your slavery. Remember, 400 years of slavery that they endured as a people and brought them out of that slavery and miraculously took care of them over the course of 40 years as they are now sitting in the, in the plains of Moab across from the city of Jericho with the Jordan River separating them from the Promised Land. And they are here now, and God is reminding them that I am the God who brought you to this place. And then he begins the commandments. Verse 7, the first commandment. You must not have any other God but me. As I mentioned earlier, one of the primary challenges that Israel Israel will face are these polytheistic nations that they will encounter. And this will be a direct challenge to their relationship with God, Jehovah, with their one and only God. You see, God will tolerate no rivals in his efforts to win and to keep the hearts of his people. God will not be satisfied with being their favorite God or their go-to God or their Sunday God or Saturday God in the case of the Israelites. He is to be their only God, no exception. Now, as I was reading that and thinking about that, I was thinking a little different today. I don't feel like today is the Christian church that we're battling a polytheistic society around us, that we're battling people who believe in many gods. Really, what we're facing today is, is, a, is a culture and a community that doesn't believe in any god. Probably the greatest challenge we have is atheism the lack of belief in a God. I don't know too many people who believe in many gods. I mean, I'm sure there are those that are out there, but the primary challenge for us today as we, as we speak of God and we speak of Jesus and we share the gospel are those who believe that, that there is no God, probably the challenge we have today. But what God was dealing with and what Moses was presenting was how to deal with all of these gods that the other nations 
would put before them. You must have, you must not have any other God but me. The second commandment we find in verse 8 through 10 reads, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and the fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who obey who love me and obey my commands. This commandment prohibited the making or the worshiping of any idols. Not just idols representing other gods, but idols or anything that was the effort to represent God himself. No idols, either of God or of any other gods. Forms of idols can be physical or external objects. But we also know, especially today, that they can be spiritual or internal in nature. Whatever takes our attention, whatever takes our focus off of God and moves it into something else is very likely working as an idol in our life. It has captured us. It has taken our attention. They can be like the golden calf, as we had seen made way back in Exodus and worshipped at Mount Sinai with disastrous results, by the way. Or they can be that internal focus, such as money or personal wealth or seeking personal beauty or popularity or, or all types of sinful activity that can take our eyes off of God. Anything that takes our eyes off of God and puts it somewhere else. Now note that this commandment carries with it its own penalty, unlike most of the other commandments. This commandment reminds us that God is a jealous God meaning that he's not going to share us with any other gods. And for those who turn away from his love and affection, specifically who reject him, he will lay that sin on the children to the third and the fourth generation of that sinner. Now, many take that statement literally and believe that God condemns the second generation and the third generation and the fourth generation for the sins of their father or their grandfather or their great-grandfather. But in reality, from other scripture, we know that God is not doing that. What God says here and what Moses is, is relaying here is that that sin can be carried on through generations. And we probably all know generational families where sin because of how a child was raised in a particular family that they carry on the sin of that family and may carry it on to the next generation and the next. Now that sin can be broken as simply as somebody who turns away from that sin and accepts today Jesus as their personal Savior and that cycle can be broken. But God is not saying here that he is directly punishing those, but he will allow that sin to be carried forth into future generations until such time as they choose to come back to him. At the same time, he mentions a thousand generations, that if they love him and obey him, they will feel his lavish and unfailing love upon them. How long is a thousand generations? Most people will say it's forever. Let's just call it forever. A thousand generations that will feel his love if they love him and obey him. Verse 11 talks, gives us our third commandment. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Now you may recall that God revealed his name to Moses in order to help him as he went into Egypt when they would ask, who is the name of this God? God gave him his name, Yahweh. God doesn't prohibit the use of his name. Many Orthodox Jews over the centuries have chosen not to use his name. They do not use his name, believing that they don't want to take any chance that they mis may misuse it or use it in vain, so they use the term the Lord to replace the actual name of God. But God doesn't say here that we cannot use his name. We are told not to misuse his name. 
Now, a common understanding that I think we would all agree with is profanity or blasphemy, using the Lord's name in vain in such a way would clearly be in violation of the third commandment here. But there's also other ways that the Lord's name must, be, must not be misused. We should not use, misuse the name of the Lord for such purposes as placing curses upon people. We should not use God's name to, you know, to misuse or to mip, mip, manipulate people, to try to get them to do something that is not biblical and is not you know, offered as something within the Bible. And I think one of the most challenging of the misuse of the name is when we make an oath in the name of, of God and then we fail to follow through with it. What a violation that is, potentially, of the third commandment. I've broken so many promises to God over the course of the years. I mean, I'm, 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 I don't think I would be alone in this room, but as a younger man fighting, you know, sin in my life and other things, I would commit to God. I would just, you know, give God my solemn promise that this will never happen again. And then two days later, three days later, I'm back facing God again, saying, well, I guess I was wrong, but let's try this again. Those are the challenges that we face. But I heard an interesting story from a pastor on the radio the other day that talked about when he was in college and a group of, of uh, the pastor was talking about doing an outreach or doing a missionary, going into the mission field. And he called for people in this college class who would take an oath that they would enter the mission field upon completion of their, of their studies and that they would spend a year in the mission field. And he said at that time, five students came forward and they took a vow before God that they would, would finish their, their college education and that they would commit to spend the next year in service. This pastor said, I didn't do it because I didn't feel that I was called to do that, and I wasn't going to make a promise to God that I couldn't keep. And yet, he said, I know for a fact that all five of those eventually did not go into the mission field as they had vowed before God. So we must be careful to misuse, not to misuse his name in those ways, as well as, you know, profanity and using what we would consider to be those other ways. In other words, God's name is to be treasured and to be respected. And it is not to be used in some informal or disrespectful way. Verse 12 gives us the fourth commandment. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. So the Sabbath day, honor the Sabbath. God spoke often about the Sabbath. As I go back thinking about all of the the different chapters and the previous four books of the Bible, probably no other topic was brought up more often than the Sabbath. How many times God had instructed Moses and others that they were to obey the Sabbath and, and the Sabbath even expanded into additional wider areas all the way to the Jubilee. The Sabbath was very important to God, and it was repeatedly reminded and warned the people. One day in seven days. Now, the Sabbath was not to be seen as a restriction or a punishment, but truly as a day of rest, a day of liberation from the work of the week. Note that this commandment not only calls for a day of rest, but it also seems to call for ordinary work to be done on those other six days. So it appears to some that God is calling us to work and then to take our Sabbath day one day in seven. The commandment was the first positive action, the first direction to do. The others were don't do. This one says do this, observe the Sabbath. Three reasons for the Sabbath generally. One, it recalls the creation and the pattern given by God to work for six days and then to rest on the seventh. 
Two, it truly provides rest for us. I bet everybody here, especially when you were working full-time or if you're working full-time, you look forward to that day off. You look forward to that day of rest. Unfortunately, in today's modern environment, we usually have 1,600 things we have to do on that day between yard work and taking care of everything and sports events and all of those other many things. So I'm not sure that we really are accomplishing what God called for originally in his Sabbath requirement, but it is to, at least it's a day that we're not doing what we do the other six days. And three, it sets Israel apart as a special day dedicated to God. You know, in Eastern religions in the history, there's very little evidence of any other nation living under this Sabbath type requirement. This was unique to the people of Israel and through God's word. While this commandment is the only commandment not mentioned in the New Testament, thus leading many scholars to believe that it no longer applies to us today. You know, a lot of studies that Jesus, in fact, became our Sabbath and it was no longer the need for us to practice the Sabbath. But one should still consider the wisdom of God's words and his plan. Rest for the mind, rest for the body, rest for the soul, as well as the ability to devote a day to him, as many still do. We do see one difference here from the Exodus 20 list, the original list, and that is Moses references the Exodus from Egypt here as the reason for God's command for the Sabbath day, while in Exodus 20 he mentioned the creation, the creation itself as being the reason for the Sabbath. So one small difference noted there between the two lists. Verse 16 is the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, and then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So here's a quick note. The first four commandments deal with your relationship with God, with a person's relationship with God. These next commandments deal with your relationship or a person's relationship with his or her neighbor. Four of them are directed to God. Only me, no idols, so forth. These now talk about how we treat our neighbor. We have an important transition here, which is that change. And we'll see how that division applies to the two greatest commandments identified by Jesus in Matthew 22 when we look at chapter 6 next week. The fifth commandment calls for us to honor our mothers and fathers as they are the ones who gave us our lives and through whom this covenant is being passed on to future generations. Honoring our mothers and our fathers seems to be a little bit missing in our Western culture today, doesn't it? I really see this as being one of the lacking things that we have. And I know that there are people sitting in this room now who have children who they don't feel honor them and who, you know, would meet this requirement. Seems to be the culture of our Western nations right now, where parents and parenthood are not highly regarded. But, you know, there are many cultures that value the parent as one of the most important parts of the family. I once read a story about the response to a certain question, and that question was, if your house is on fire, and inside that house was your mother, your wife, Apparently this was asked to men, so let me just put that into that perspective. Your mother, your wife, and your children, and you could only save one, who would you save? Who would you choose to save? Responses from Western culture predominantly chose the children. Many of us here today would say, well, I would, I would get the children. I read one where somebody said that if they, you know, if I saved my wife, she would kill me if I didn't save the child. So in the Western culture, we say we go after the child. But Eastern cultures, who tend to more highly honor their parents, leaned in greater numbers toward the mother. Why? Because their mother could not be replaced. They could marry again, they can have more children, but I could never replace my mother. 
So just a little different attitude, a little different thought process about where the parents sit in, in the hierarchy of the relationship or the importance within the family. You know, I pray that none of us are ever put in that position, but it does help us to understand a little bit better that, you know, this commandment of what it may, you know, of honoring our parents. Now, I would be the first to say that there are many parents who have acted in ways that they don't deserve honor or respect from their children. And God certainly recognized that in his command to the parents in Ephesians 6, verse 4, when he said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So it's a two-way street. In America, we have problems with both commandments, parenting and respecting our parents. And we should also note that this commandment offers a blessing. It's the only commandment that actually offers a blessing to those who obey it. It says, then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. No other commandment gives us such a specific blessing. Parents who raise their children well should receive the honor and respect of their children and through that, we're told that they can certainly result in a long and a full life. Doesn't always seem to work that way, as I've said, but I don't put that on God. I put that on a culture that has grown to the point of really removing the importance of family as a whole. It's just, it, it, you see it all around us. We see it all around us of the family is becoming less and less and less important. And I just don't know how you, how we have to get things back on the right path and the right track in order to get these things working back together. Verse 17 in the sixth commandment, you must not murder. The Hebrew word used here is rasach, meaning to murder. Does it mean to kill? Often people confuse that word and insert the word thou shalt not kill. But the word that's being used here means murder. It means the thought of premeditation or being done because of personal grievance. It is not the taking of a life accidentally or in self-defense or in battle. This is not the type, this is not where, you know, a violation of the, of the commandment here in place Murder, as we've talked before, requires the death of the murderer. It's a capital punishment issue from the Bible, from Genesis chapter 9, and it's carried through the Old Testament. So murder is pretty straightforward. Thou shalt not murder. Verse 18, the seventh commandment, you must not commit adultery. Adultery is the violation of the marital covenant. We're not talking here about other sexual immorality fornication and other things. Adultery is specific to the marital covenant. Adultery involves a sexual relationship between people where one or both are married to another person. And of course, because of the unfaithfulness in that relationship, those people may be very likely to be unfaithful in other commitments, such as their commitment to God. And in fact, adultery is not just a violation of a promise made to another. Adultery is a violation of a promise that was made to God. Malachi 2.14, God says, you cry out as he speaks to the people of Israel. Why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young, but you have been unfaithful to her, though she remained your faithful partner and the wife of your marriage vows. Adultery. Verse 19, the eighth commandment, you must not steal. In reality, everything belongs to God, and when we choose to take the property of another person, once again, we are breaking our commitment to trust in God. In reality, we're denying his promised provision to us, actually showing a lack of faith in him and in that provision, and, and or we're unhappy with the things that God has given us. We are not, shall not steal. Because in essence, it all belongs to him. And when we take it from another, we are offending him as well as the people who we took it from. The ninth commandment, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. 
False witness against our neighbor brings to mind immediately to me the thoughts of perjury, bearing false witness, character assassination. Man, how relevant is that in the world today when you think of, of you know, terms like cancel culture and, you know, the attacking. It, it seems so consistent that instead of dealing with issues, we attack the person today. That we don't try to work out our disagreements, but the best way to overcome somebody is not to, to win them in the argument, it's to attack them and to silence them in some way. Today, a differing opinion is not only shouted down in many cases, but the person is then labeled as a hater, or as an evil person, and someone who is not to be listened to. To me, clearly what God is telling us not to do in this commandment to not bring that type of witness against a person or their character, but to, to deal with the issue. And then verse 21, the 10th commandment, you must not covet your neighbor's wife, you must not covet your neighbor's house or land, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now the 10th commandment, you may not have thought of it this way, but I found this to be an interesting thought that the Tenth Commandment is somewhat different from the other commandments. In that while the other commandments deal with external issues, actions, conducts, don't lie, don't, don't bring bare false witness, don't murder, don't kill, don't have idols, don't do these things. These are external actions and conduct, both positive and negative. The Tenth Commandment deals with what one might say is an internal state of mind. It's dealing with my thoughts covetousness. It's really one of the only commandments that the rest of the world may not even know what I'm thinking. There may not be somebody else who knows what I'm thinking and how I'm, how I'm thinking about a particular issue, but we know that God knows because nothing that I'll be able to hide from Him. It is a violation of this commandment. Think about this. The violation of a commandment that says do not covet is very likely to lead us to violate the other commandments listed above. When I covet, it may seek me, it may lead me to find some other idols in my life. When I covet, it may seek even me to the point of seeking other gods or or looking at other gods and listening and finding out more about what they have to offer me. It may lead me to murder. It may lead me to steal, to commit adultery, to even bear false witness in the effort to get what I want. The 10th commandment is something that I think we really, of all these commandments, this is the one that I'd really like you to give some thought to tonight. Covetousness really means that one is not content with their own life. If I'm coveting something, then it means that for some reason I must not be content with what I have. And lacking contentment, they pursue things that are not theirs. It may not be meant to be theirs and certainly doesn't belong to them at that point in time. I probably suffered a little bit of that when I was running up my debt and living my life as a kid. I just wanted all that good stuff. I think, boy, the Tenth Commandment was really, I was working hard to overcome that. The state of our mind is important. It really is. Jesus spoke of this as he presented his Sermon on the Mount, where, for instance, in Matthew 5, 21, 22, he said, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. So there we have a violation of the commandments. But I say even if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So I think we'd all agree that we shouldn't murder. We would all agree the Ten Commandments tells us that we're not to murder, but Jesus looks deeper at our hearts and at our minds. As to adultery, Jesus says that someone who even looks at a woman lustfully is already guilty of breaking that commandment. <coughs> Excuse me. So many sins begin with covetousness. Greed, jealousy, I think, are probably toward the top of the list. The negative impact of relationships, 
our spouses maybe not being as good as the neighbor across the street, our children not being as smart or not getting the athletic awards that perhaps their cousins are getting, and it causes us to, to, to have a desire to be dissatisfied with what we're seeing. The next door neighbor's new car or boat, the coworker who got the promotion that I wanted, all of these things begin with coveting, or in other words, not being content with what life has given us. And pastors are certainly not exempt, believe me. You know, it's very easy for pastors to begin to, to, you know, when they look at a big new church and think, why can't we have that church? Or their growing congregation of another church and yours is not growing or maybe yours is dwindling and you think, why can't I get more people in here? How come I'm not the pastor on the radio that, that I listen to every day? Or, or I saw the guy's new book and why can't I write a book? And pretty ease, quickly, you become discontent what God has given you as a ministry. I'm guilty of that every once in a while. I think that we ought to have 500 people in here. We're a great church, and how come we don't have 500 people here? And yet, I still go back to one of our board members who said at the very beginning of our church, as we talked about the size of our church, when he said, if it never gets any bigger than this, I will still always be blessed to be here. It doesn't matter how many people, as long as I'm with people that I love. And I keep that in the back of my mind every so often to just help keep that thought process under control in my own mind. And so it's through this final commandment that we may find our greatest challenge to obedience. I mean, I'm not out murdering people. I'm not out stealing today. I'm not out you know, committing adultery, uh -uh, no, no. But number 10 would be one on this list that I might say, you know, there are days when I'm challenged by this. Because while I can claim obedience to many of these commandments, really making me no better than a Pharisee or a Sadducee, I don't believe that I can ever be completely obedient to this 10th commandment. And thus, it helps me to understand that no matter how hard I try, I cannot meet God's standard of moral behavior. There's no way that I can be good enough. And understanding that because I'm guilty of breaking this law, no matter how hard I may try, I'm going to be guilty. And Paul in Romans 3, 19, 20 helps us to see this, saying, obviously the law applies to those in whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And because of that, we certainly need something more than what we have. So let's move into the rest of our chapter. We're going to have opportunities to look at these commandments again moving forward. Uh, just very quickly, beginning in verse 22, we read, The Lord spoke these words to all of you assembled here at the foot of the mountain. He spoke with a loud voice from the heart of the fire, surrounded by clouds and deep darkness. This was all he said at that time, and he wrote his words on two stone tablets and gave them to me. So Moses again points back to Mount Sinai, where God for the first time appeared before the people of Israel, calling them to the mountain, but warning them not to go past the base of the mountain or they would be destroyed. And in his own voice, God gave them these Ten Commandments. And that was all he said to them at that time, ultimately putting those Ten Commandments onto two stone tablets and giving them to Moses for the people. Beginning in verse 23, we are reminded of the response of the people that day. But when you heard the voice from the heart of the darkness, while the mountain was blazing with fire, all your tribal leaders and elders came to me. They said, look, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice from the heart of the fire. Today we have seen that God can speak to us humans, and yet we live. But now, why should we risk death again? If the Lord our God speaks to us again, we will certainly die and be consumed by this awesome fire. 
Can any living thing hear the voice of the living God from the heart of the fire as we did and yet survive? Go yourself and listen to what the Lord our God says. Then come and tell us everything he tells you and we will listen and obey. The people recognized that they had heard God's voice and it was very scary to them. Why? Well, thunder, lightning, smoke all of the special effects that were happening around the mountain, perhaps the loud voice of God itself, all powerful, but perhaps the people already had a sense that they were not worthy to have God speak to them again. And that if God chose to speak to them again, they would surely die. So here are the people. They already recognize that we are not worthy of God speaking to us. And that he will, will, it will not go well for us if God is speaking to us. And it was then they recognized that they needed the intermediary to go between them and God. Someone who could speak to God on their behalf and in turn bring his words to them. And yes, they willingly entered into a covenant with God and promised to obey him. But God knew that they weren't capable of keeping these laws. But it's an indication to me that they also knew deep down that they couldn't keep these laws either. And that a relationship was that close and that personal with God himself would only lead to their destruction. Thus Moses was asked to serve as their intermediary just as Christ serves as ours. Because by ourselves we could never face God and we would be judged for our failure to follow his commandments just as they would. But through Christ We certainly can. So how did God react to the request of his people? Verse 28, the Lord heard the request you made to me, and he said, I have heard what the people said to you, and they are right. Oh, that they would always have hearts like this, that they might fear me and obey all my commands. If they did, they and their descendants would prosper forever. Go and tell them, return to their tents, but you stand here with me so I can give you all my commands, decrees, and regulations. You must teach them to the people so they can obey them in the land that I am giving them as their possession. We see that God saw that to be good. He saw the hearts of those people. He saw the hearts of the people at Mount Sinai. And he saw in the hearts of the people a fear of him. And through that fear they would obey his commandments. And if they could do that, they would prosper forever. The Hebrew word used here for fear is yar, meaning fear, but also meaning reverence or honor. I believe unbelievers should have a fear of God's judgment upon them. A person who does not, has not accepted Jesus Christ who is an unbeliever should certainly have fear of what is coming. For believers... I believe that fear should be more of a reverence or an honor of God. That we should be in awe of him and his power. And while accepting his wonderful gift of salvation, because he loves us, we also love him and revere him and honor him by trying to obey his commandments. Fearing God means that we have such a reverence for him that we allow it to impact our lives. Oswald Chambers made an interesting observation about the fear of God. He said, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you don't fear God, you fear everything else. Make sense? If I fear him, I have nothing to worry about. If I don't fear him, I have everything to worry about. The chapter closes beginning with verse 32. So Moses told the people, you must be careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God following his instructions in every detail. Stay on the path that the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. Then you will live long and prosperous lives in the land you are about to enter and occupy. Something here for us all to take home tonight. Be careful to follow God's commands. Stay on the path that God has put us on and live long and prosperous lives. So next week, we'll jump into chapter 6 where we'll see this very well-known verse.
Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord with your, with your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Sound familiar? It should. We'll find out more next week. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this revisit of the commandments as Moses is giving it to the people. And I do pray, Lord, that for each of us that we recognize still in our own lives the importance of paying attention to these. These were the foundation of your law given to the people of Israel. And nine of ten of these are mentioned again and upheld in the New Testament. And we just pray, Father, that for each of us, Lord, that we're aware of where we are in our life. We are so fortunate and blessed to have your son Jesus erase these sins from our life, both past, present, and future. But Father, help us for the obvious reasons of being obedient to you and to really live our life in a way, Father, that honors you and honors our neighbors. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray for safe travel, and please bring us back safely next week. Thank you, Father. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. God bless.
I'm torn apart this sea. You have led me through the deep, I believe. 